Okay, uh, so brief introduction Introduction myself. I, my name is Matt. I'm currently studying physics and actually working with Bruce doing the deep, applying deep learning to try to make a better hearing aid. Um, and then on this, this new presentation idea, so as, as Matt Kay said um, at the beginning of his introduction, generally speaking, we cover a previous competition that's already ended and look at what the winners did. Um, now, I, it seems like every week or every two weeks that we're here, there's a lot of people who are brand new here for the first time, which, which is great. Um, but there's kind of a fundamental problem there that we don't have a great retention rate. Uh, and the other thing is there's always people excited about starting competitions and joining one themselves. Um, so this, this presentation, I have it more in mind with, with someone who's new to Kaggle, maybe new to data science. Um, hopefully I'll have something for everyone in here. But um, yeah, so, so this competition is actually live. Um, I'm up on the leaderboard right now with um, everything I've done is in this notebook. So feel free to take it. It's, um, it's released under Apache 2.0 uh, license. Um, yeah, so I'll get started. Um, so the first thing is the competition itself here. So what the competition is, I, there was a competition that opened up that was classifying audio stuff, which seemed perfect for me. Um, I'm still pretty new to the world of audio. I'm, I'm trying to learn whatever I can about it. Um, and these techniques are much different than what I'm doing with the deep learning stuff, but it's, it's still in the same realm. Um, so what we have is a whole bunch of short audio clips, typically between a couple seconds and 10 seconds long, and we have to tag what the clip is of. Um, so they show, I don't know if this sound is going to work, but they show here a few easy examples. This is, um, oh, I might just be in my internal audio. Can you change the audio? Oh, um, uh, yeah, if, if your audio is coming out of the HDMI, you'll hear the sound system. Uh, I thought it... Okay, so we've got some audio. Um, yeah, so there, those are a couple of easier examples. Uh, they've got some tougher ones. Um, this, if anyone can hear it, is a chainsaw. Is that easy example? What was the first one? Uh, a baby laughing. Oh, okay. um, and then we've got a guitar strum here as well. Um, yeah, so a lot of the, the data they have is all taken from this free sound. Um, so it, it looks like they have a massive index of Creative Commons audio clips for you to use for whatever purposes. So I, as far as I can tell, they're just looking at finding some new ways of creating algorithms to automatically classify uh, the audio that they have in here. Um, and so a lot of the, some of the data is actually confirmed by a human, um, but a lot of it is only actually tagged by, by an algorithm. And um, so we're, we're told which data files are manually verified and which aren't. But that's definitely something to keep aware of. Um, so I'll start the presentation here now. Um, okay. So throughout the throughout this presentation slides, um, all of the code that I'm running is is shown in the slides. If you're kind of overwhelmed by the code, don't worry about it. I'll try to go through it in a way that you don't need to understand what it's actually saying. Um, there's a few, few cells that are a bit ugly, though, this being one of them. Um, but so anyone, anyone familiar with the Python um, scientific computing stack will be familiar with most of this. I mean, we've got pandas, NumPy, um, Seaborn, and Matplotlib for plotting stuff. Uh, kind of the, the only really unique uh, libraries that I've used are this light GBM. It's, it's a, a gradient boosted tree 
classifier um, that I'm using in this presentation to train all the models. And the second one is this Librosa. They do a lot of audio stuff. Um, so I use it for loading up audio files and for calculating a lot of uh, features as we go. Um, okay. Uh, so this is kind of boilerplate code. Um, if you run this yourself, um, up on where I've submitted this code to Kaggle, I set this cache flag to false. Uh, what that means is I'm not saving my intermediate results. I, it just runs a little easier on their servers. And in addition, right way through, I'm actually trimming silence out of the audio files. If you have cache set to false, it's going to train on the original audio files with, with the silence in them. If you have set cache set to true, it trains on the cropped data files. It's just something to keep in mind there. Um, that's all pretty basic. So what do we get here? Um, this right here is the first five lines of, of the CSV file we get for our training data. Um, the testing data looks exactly the same, except it doesn't have a manually verified column here. And the label's kind of a dummy label. It's, it's just the same label for everything. Um, then... Do you think that the yeah. test data all... Uh, microphone. Can we do the mic? Can we do the mic for oh. questions? Sorry, uh, there's one coming. Yeah, and please, please interrupt at any point. There's a red light on it. That means it's off at the very bottom of the mic. Hello. Yes. You good? Okay. I wanted to ask. Uh, so you said like it's not flagged as manually verified in the test data. Do we know that it was explicitly not, or it was verified? I mean, I haven't seen whether or not it's all verified. Um, so I'm I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. My. My little question is basically with the trimmed audio, um, yep. is it just trimming the end or is it trimming any silence within the uh, audio? Yeah, I'll, I'll cover that later, but I am trimming in the middle of the files as well. Okay, thanks. Okay. And so here's just a count of the number of data files that we have. Um, so we're given 9,473 training files where we have the, the known label and whether or not it's verified, and 9,400 test files. Um, and then there's 41 different categories that we're trying to predict between. Um, and so for anyone who's not familiar with how Kegel works, you're given these, if for every competition, more or less, you're given um, training da data that has the true label attached to it, and you're given testing data that does not have that true label. So the object of the competition is to train on your training data, run your model on that test data, submit your predictions, and then you're scored on how well you do on those predictions versus, um, versus the, the true values that they don't publish. Um, so then just looking at the, the ratio of uh, manually verified to unverified labels, so it's only 39% that are manually verified, so mo more than half, it's just tagged by a machine. Um, they claim they expect the, la the not verified labels to be 65 to 70% accurate, which I find a little bit concerning. Uh, so if... I didn't actually worry about the, whether or not the files were verified. I trained on everything. But definitely, if you want to continue on with this, that's an area to investigate. Um, this is just a function um, to make it easy to look at audio, audio sources. So I'm just taking a random, random sample from my training data. Um, so this is a, an audio clip of a gong. Listen to it now. That is better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and just because it's nice to look at, I um, show the time domain audio file. 
and here's just a spectrogram, um, which is, uh, shows the time on the x-axis and frequencies. So you can actually see how the frequency components of the signal change throughout time. Um, so every time we do this, it'll find a, a different sample to listen to. <laughs> That's uh, concerning. Um, oh, this will be a good one. The saxophone. Yeah, I always like the instrument ones because you can often see the harmonics and the frequencies. So that's a constant. Um, yes, um, burping is also in the <laughs> in the training and testing data. <laughs> well, I'll see. Oh, there we go. Because <laughs> everybody wanted that. Um, hey all right. Hmm? Oh. Um, How many labels or categories are there? It's 41. And can there be multiple uh, labels for a single clip? No. No, each, each audio file is a single label. So here's a list of all 41. Uh, about half of them are instruments, um, various random things. Um, but yeah, pretty wide range. Um, and then, so this is plotting the distributions of the labels themselves. So often in these KO competitions, uh, you'll, you'll actually have very highly imbalanced classes where you've got maybe a thousand uh, of one label to every one of another label. But this competition is actually pretty even. Um, so, once again, I, I didn't actually worry about the label distribution at all. Um, but there's definitely things you can do, um, passing in the prior distributions to your models. Um, and then in addition, this shows how each category, how much are manually verified or not. Um, so for this applause, very few are actually verified manually. Um, whereas the saxophone or telephone or um, gunshot here are almost entirely manually verified. Um, so here's a... I like to get started when I'm doing a Kaggle competition with kind of essentially the Hello World version. Um, try to just make sure that you're creating your submission file correctly on really really simple features. So here what I'm doing is I'm loading up the data file, um, that's just the audio file, and taking a just a few statistical things, the mean, the min and max, standard deviation, length of the file. Um, RMS is basically the power in the audio. Um, and skewness and kurtosis have to do with essentially the shape of the distribution of the data. Yep. Uh, the microphone. Uh, how is audio represented? Is it just the sequence of numbers? Uh, you're, you're off. Yeah, how is audio represented? Is this just a sequence of numbers? Yeah, so if the way that a computer sees an audio file is just a series of amplitudes. Um, so all of this audio is at 44,100 hertz. So that means for every second of audio, there's 44,100 data points. And it's essentially a floating point number, um, usually centered around zero. Um, so that's, that's what the, yeah, that's what the audio looks like. So all these statistics work really well on it. Um, audio is also typically a fairly normal or Gaussian distribution. Um, so that's why the skewness and kurtosis tend to work well. Most of it will be near, um, I suppose, zero for both. Um, so here I'm using um, uh, progress apply. Uh, it's a function on pandas. So I'm applying this, this feature creation function. I'm applying it to every row of the data frame. Um, now, if you've run this, if you've run this notebook before already, it just loads the files up from cache from a saved um, CSV file. 
if you were to run this for the first time, it takes about 10 minutes to go through it all. Um, so I just cached it for, for the interest of time here. Um, and you can also manually create a few features. Um, so here I just did the ratio of the RMS to the standard deviation. Um, there's fairly similar metrics. Um, so we, we might see that a few, few samples actually um, have, have an RMS over standard deviation different than everything else that might tell us information about it. Um, and this was just a random one I tried out where a ratio of the max to the minimum um, that, that would essentially just show that maybe you have a certain very short spike in the audio. I don't know um, if, if it's actually doing much with that, that metric, but um, yeah, I just threw it in for fun. Um, so here we can, these are just two basic functions to make it easy to look at data that I'll show you in the next slide. Um, so for any variable name, you can just put the feature in there and show either a histogram of the values. Um, so this is actually in log domain. I can um, turn that off for a sec. Um, so most of our kurtosis values are very close to, to zero. Um, but there's a few of them that are kind of deviated from, from the most frequent. Um, and then the other plot I, I can make here is a box plot. So that actually shows the, the mean and the limits for each of our categories. Um, so we can see that most, most of our categories have very low kurtosis, or um, with a, a handful of exceptions. Um, so the, the machine learning algorithm I'm going to be using is, is essentially a decision tree. Um, so what it likes to do is put files into buckets. So it's really easy for it to put, to create a bucket where if kurtosis is over 2,000, then it's going to be finger snapping. So it's not necessarily a good thing that it can do a perfect split on that, but we certainly have a correlation between a few of these features and having a higher kurtosis. So, do you know what the normal or Gaussian distribution is? Yeah. yeah. Oh. So someone asked what exactly kurtosis is. So if you have a normal distribution, it's the bell curve that most people are familiar with. If the data fits nicely to that bell curve shape, um, using the mean and standard deviation, it has very low kurtosis. But if it has a really a weird shape where it's got very long tails or a very sharp peak in the middle, then you tend to have a high kurtosis. Um, so my theory here is that the higher kurtosis is actually coming from clipping, where you have a lot of values that are saturated at the highest value that can be stored in the data file. Um, so there'll be a significant peak in the very center of the distribution. Um, and then relatively short tails, given, given how tall the distribution is. But I haven't actually looked into that. It's just, just a hypothesis. Um, so we can type whatever we want, and we can um, check out. <laughs> Not whatever we want. Um, so skewness is, uh, along with kurtosis, it has to do with that normal distribution. It just tells how far squished it is to one side or another. Um, what else? Um, what was your made up feature? My made up feature. So there's that RMS over standard deviation. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so once again with that one, we've got a handful of different um, categories that show a good output. And then I had the min over Oh, max over min. So this one's a little noisier, but I um, kind of expected that. Um, okay, so did you have? No, I'm just smiling. 
Okay. <laughs> um, so one, a lot of work in data science and machine, learn, machine learning is about cleaning your data. Um, so I happen to have a few NANs that I know of in this data set. Um, so I happen to actually know why those are here. It's, it's mentioned in the forums here. Um, if we go back to the competition page. So there's a couple files that, um, where are we here? Yeah, there's a few empty files in the testing set. Um, so the competition organizer told us we don't have to worry about them. So I just put zeros in for them. Um, so when I took the RMS over standard deviation, that gave me not a number because you can't divide zero by zero. Same for the min over ma max over min. Um, so I happen to know that I can just ignore these NANs, um, but be very careful with that because there's often a lot of a lot of information in certain values like those. How many uh, NANs are in the file? So he's asking how many. Sorry? He was asking how many NANs are in the file. So it is just three. Um, there were three bad audio files. <coughs> Everything else is well defined. So I'm just using pandas to change the NANs to zeros because it doesn't make any difference. Um, so this is one of my ugly functions. Um, basically what it's doing is just getting a list of all my feature names and it's using, um, it's using a function to give me a randomized split so I can create both a training and a validation set. So the, the purpose of that is if you're training an algorithm, you want to see how it's doing um, locally on data that it hasn't seen before. So I'm holding out a small validation set just to check the progress and see how my, my algorithm's actually doing. Um, so this function just allows me to easily turn my pandas data frames into my training and validation and test set. Uh, I'm sure you're going to answer it right after this, but what is the score or what's the metric you're trying to optimize? Yeah, um, I am going to re. I am going to talk about that pretty soon. It's um, mean average precision of the top three, uh, but I'll go over that better in a second here. I have a question too. Okay, uh, is there a reason that you're not stratifying the classes in the train and test split? Lazy. Lazy. <laughs> yeah. It's just a first pass at it. Um, so here I'm just using that function I created in the previous slide. All right, maybe I should just explain that with, and, sure. and a little more because I was just asked. So uh, stratifying your uh, train test split just means keeping the same proportion of classes in your train and test split. It's, it's typically very important when you have imbalanced classes. Mm -hmm. When they're relatively balanced, it's it'll just randomly end up around equal. Yeah. Also important when you don't have a lot of data, which I'm kind of on the cusp at in, in this competition. Um, so here I, I just kept 25% for my validation set. So it gives me 7,000 to train on, 2,400 to validate on. And this is pretty specific to this light GBM they require you to essentially create their specific data set so they can train on it better. Um, so this is just a function to create that. And here we train our first model. So it'll only take a minute, but while this is running, um, we'll take a look at that map three um, that Matt K had asked about. Um, so Wendy from Kaggle created a notebook um, to explain this, this loss metric. But basically how it works is for this competition, we're allowed to submit three labels. And you get a better score for the earlier you predict the label. So basically, if, if you predict the correct label first, you get one point. If you correct, uh, predict it second, you get half a point. If you predict it third, you get a third of a point. Um, and then that's... And, and if you don't predict in those three, you get nothing. 
So then the loss metric is simply that averaged over the entire data set. Um, so we should be, should be done here. Um, so here, this, is, this log loss is reporting um, the loss on my validation set. And I actually set the model to finish my training early if it stops improving. Um, so there we stopped at, after 472 iterations. Um, uh, so these are just the two functions to calculate this map three. Um, so now I'm predicting on my validation set, and I see a local score of 0.4499. Um, so we can look at the how the leaderboard's looking. Um, and we see the top guys are all 0.9 and above. Um, so 0.4 is actually pretty far down there, but I didn't give it very good features, so I wasn't expecting much. Um, so we head to the next slide. Um, uh, so this is one, one thing I love about these tree-based algorithms is you can actually see kind of an approximate importance of each feature that you have. Um, so these are the 10 most important features that the, the, the um, model was able to split on. And in case you can't see it too well, up at the top here is length. So that was the most indicative feature of the, the whole data set. Um, second is kurtosis that we took a look at earlier. We've got the mean of the data, we've got the skewness. Um, and at the very bottom, we've got RMS. Um, but one thing to be careful about, it can be misleading if you have two very similar metrics. So the standard deviation and the RMS are telling me pretty close to the same thing. So if I only had one of the two of those, the other one would actually be higher up in my feature importance. Um, it's called a collinear feature. Uh, so don't trust these importances entirely, um, but they're, they're pretty good first order approximation just, just to get started. And then um, just for safety's sake, I want to take a look at a few predictions that my model actually made. Um, so in the first file I've got here, the truth is fireworks. That was my first prediction, which is great. Um, we've got electric piano. That's in the top three here. Um, so I actually did okay. Uh, considering how little information I gave the model, I'm quite happy with how that did. Um, so at this point, I'm actually going to run the predictions on, on my test set. Um, so typically with, uh, with a validation score so low down at 0.45 here, given how far down the leaderboard that is, I usually wouldn't care. I would just use that and move on. Um, oh, sorry. Actually, first, before we do that, I've also got spot checking audio files here. Um, so it's using that same play audio, but it says what it predicted it to be. So it's assuming this is a flute. Um, and once again, we, <laughs> um, we have these cool harmonics showing up in the, in the spectrogram as it moves up and down the scale. Um, so we've got writing squeak or tearing for this one. So it sounds like squeak to me. Um, so it got in the top three. <laughs> That's good. Did a clarinet. Um, trumpet. Yep. It's definitely right there. So the nice thing about visualizing the data here um, is I can see what actually has a lot of silence, either at the ends or in the middle. So it's actually looking at the data that I kind of clued in that maybe I should look at getting rid of the, oops, getting rid of the silence. 
Um, so it's always good to keep an idea or just keep an idea. Okay, so that one it got wrong, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on now. So I'm actually going to create this submission. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, there's two reasons to do that. The first is now I'm on the leaderboard and I'm at the bottom of the leaderboard. So now I have no choice but to keep going in the competition. Um, whereas if, if I never submitted this, maybe I could just leave it alone and keep going. Uh, but the second actually more important thing is to make sure that your, your local cross-validation score is actually in relatively good agreement with the test set or, or your public leaderboard score. Um, so I can see here, my validation was 0.4499, and when I submitted it to the leaderboard, I got a score of 0.445. So that's, that's pretty close. I'm, if I can consistently be that close to leaderboard scores, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Um, so periodically checking to make sure that your local validation works, that you're creating all your data correctly, um, it's just good peace of mind and and helps you actually iterate on your models without submitting. Um, so you've only got a limited number of submissions per day. So this, this local validation allows you to try out more models, knowing how they'll do. Okay. Um, no. Okay. So now we've got our very basic model done. We want to start moving forwards now and actually create the features that we're more interested in. So the first thing that I wanted to do is trim the silence off of those files. And at the same time, I actually don't want to get rid of all the information um, because there's information in the fact that there's silence trimmed. Um, so what I've done here, it's kind of in two steps. The first thing I do is I use... Um, this function right here, which trims the ends of the audio file. So get rid of the silence at the beginning and the end. Um, now there's a few parameters you can set. Um, I just set it to anything below 40 dB. Um, I call silence. Um, and then I record both the length of the intermediate file and the ratio of the intermediate which is the length of intermediate over the length of the original signal. So essentially what percentage is retained after I crop the ends off. Um, and the second thing I'm doing, um, the easiest way I found to get rid of silence in the middle was using this uh, split function from the Librosa library. I used the same decibel threshold. And if it found multiple splits, then I just concatenate them back into a vector, and that's my new audio file. Um, and once again, I take the ratio of the final length of the, over the intermediate length. Um, so that gives me the percentage that was, that was cut off between cropping the ends and cropping the intermediate. Um, so getting it as this ratio is nice for the tree-based methods, because they like putting stuff in buckets. So if they can find a bucket where more than half of the audio is clipped from the center, um, it likes to look for things like that instead of the total length that it was decreased by. Um, and then while I'm at it, if, if I've got the cache flag set, then I save the trimmed audio file. Um, and here's, here's what I'm doing to deal with the, the bad audio files. I'm just returning zeros instead of, instead of the data. Um, so now I apply it to the data frame, um, but I've got it cached, so I'm just loading the cache. And I'm just plotting out how, much, how many of the audio files were trimmed. Um, so it kind of gives me uh, two pieces of information. First, whether or not... Um, or if, if I'm kind of cropping the right number of files, if it's cropping like 99%, then I'm probably getting rid of stuff that I don't want to. 
or if it's only getting rid of a tenth of a percent, then I should probably relax the thresholds a bit and allow it to, to crop a little bit more silence out. Uh, and the second thing is it helps me see if my training and testing data are from more or less the same distribution. Um, so I can see here, the, I mean, that's 7% off. That's just a couple percent. So more or less the same amount of silence is trimmed off of the training and testing data. Um, so that also helps give me confidence that my testing data is similar to my training data and not, not recorded significantly differently. Um, so here we go, creating a... This, this is more just for my own validation's sake to see if these features improved at all. So here I'm creating a new data split um, with all of my training data. I'm creating my light GBM data set, and then I train it with the, with the light GBM model. Um, and it takes about the same time, just a little bit longer to run. Um, so there we go. Um, stopped after 482 iterations. Um, so now I run, run my own local validation. And I see that my local validation score went from 0.45 up to 0.5. So I, I think that's a pretty good, pretty good bump for just a couple extra features. And as far as I can tell, I can believe this local validation number. So I'm, I'm happy to continue on with that. So I didn't bother submitting that one. Um, and now we take a look at the feature importances. Um, so, so like I said earlier, in these importances, you can sometimes run into collinear features. So previously, length was my most important feature, and kurtosis was the second. So now that I've got more information about the length of files, they're kind of playing off of each other and each taking some of the importance. So length went from first to seventh here um, of all of my features. Um, and actually, this ratio of the intermediate um, so that's the amount of silence that was trimmed out of the middle. No, sorry, the silence that was trimmed off the, trimmed off the ends. Um, that's actually now my fourth most important feature. Um, so the, it's all fine and dandy, but now we need to start creating some real features. Um, we're only going to go get, get so far on those basic statistical things. So there's these... Um, MEL frequency septal coefficients. Uh, it's a big, big fancy acronym. Um, it's been used in, in audio recognition for quite a long time. Um, I think it was developed back in the 80s and um, it was kind of the, the state of the art back then for, for recognizing audio. So what, what, the, what the MFCCs do, it's kind of conceptually similar to a spectrogram. So this is actually an image of an MFCC um, down here. So like the spectrogram, we've got time on, time on the horizontal axis, and then we have these MFCC coefficients on the vertical axis. Um, now, they're similar to frequencies, um, but I'm sure some mathematicians here are going to get mad at me for saying that. Um, but we can take a look at how we actually create these MFCCs. So the first thing you do is take the fast Fourier transform. Um, now that's a discrete fast, discrete time Fourier transform, um, similar to uh, the same way that you create a spectrogram. But the problem with with the the Fourier transform is it does equal splits in all of the different frequency ranges. So, for example, if, let's say you've got 20 different frequency bands from 0 to 20 kilohertz, each one of them is going to be a 1,000 hertz step as you go up this vertical axis. Uh, the, the problem with that is we, 
the way our ears work, we can't distinguish well between um, the different higher frequencies versus the lower frequencies. So we want much finer resolution in the lower frequencies and coarser resolution as we get to the higher frequencies. So a 1,000 hertz jump from 19 to 20 kilohertz is almost meaningless, whereas from 1,000 to 2,000 is quite a big jump. Mike? Um, from a machine learning perspective, is that, like, is that important? Because it's not the human being that's listening to this, it's the machine, right? Like, I mean, is that, or is yeah. this just a way of like, like, yeah, um, classified as human beings. People who are classified as human beings. Yeah, um, that's actually an awesome question, and I, I don't know. Um, I wondered that myself too, but um, Bruce seems to be thinking. <laughs> oh, no, it's not obvious. So it's not obvious that this is the right thing to do or that these are the right features. But uh, in a lot of machine learning, we do, uh, we don't completely discard everything we've learned in the past. And obviously, uh, this comes out of a long history of speech processing, and these have proven to be much more uh, important features in, in the past. So it's natural to, to try to use them here and shape the models that we're using uh, for machine learning, deep learning approaches to things that have worked in the past uh, to try it out. But it's not guaranteed. And uh, for deep learning in particular, if you've got enough data, you don't even have to define these. You can let the model learn itself. Something that's maybe a little bit like this, but better. Um, so it's all up for grabs, basically. Yeah, no problem. Um, why is the frequency of 700 like so significant in that formula? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, okay. I'm sure there's a textbook you could read, like 200 pages in the history of MFCCs. But <laughs> it, um, I'll, I'll repeat it. Or, never mind. I was just going to make the point that, I mean, these classes might be violins and whatever, but I mean, they're profoundly like human domain classes, right? I mean, if you think of all of the sounds that might exist, right, these aren't like like the tick at the end of my speech or something, so um, mm -hmm. you could justify a human interpretation for listening based on that. Yep. But actually getting back to your point about the whether or not it's the best thing for the machine, if we look at convolutional neural network outputs in the middle, um, they don't look like what I would <laughs> personally perceive as, as an image. So obviously, when we, gave, when we give the computers full reign, they do often come up with stuff that's not necessarily what works best for a human. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, work, we'll work with this. Um, maybe you could write your own creation of the MEL spectrum frequencies. and <laughs> um, Yeah, work on that. So I'll, I'll keep looking at um, what it takes to create these sceptral coefficients. So we get, our, we get our spectrogram, we apply this MEL scale filtering to give us the nonlinear frequency bins. We take the log magnitude, which once again is um, possibly just a, something that works well for humans. Um, then the, the two fun steps that I'm, I'm not very confident on, but um, first you take a discrete cosine transformation of, of this new MEL step or MEL spectrogram. Um, and my best understanding is that it actually tends to decorrelate the coefficients from the frequencies. Um, so it essentially makes them represent more varied information from each other. Um, but that's kind of the most that I understand of it. Um, and I couldn't actually see what the derivative was being taken of. Um, oh. Yeah, Bruce will cover that. Yeah, there's deri derivative features. Um, well, derivative features, that, that's a bad pun. <laughs> uh, delta and delta delta, which is basically, you just look at the differences of adjacent uh, coefficients, and then you look at the second differences, and those okay. features have proved to be informative in past work. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So it's essentially also how quickly... Yeah, 
how much it's changing in that coefficient axis between them. Yeah, and, and the discrete cosine transform, I've never completely figured this out. There, there's a lot of folklore and mythology <laughs> about it decorrelating things and so on, which is the case if you've got a first-order Markov process or something, which is not at all what we're talking about here. So okay. I, I, I'm not quite sure what it is. I, I, Another way to think of it, though, it is a dimensionality reduction. So if you're familiar with principal components analysis, mm -hmm. the way you go to a different coordinate system and you just keep the most important things. Mm -hmm. The DCT is playing a similar role here. So you might have 80 mL spectral uh, bands before the DCT. After the DCT, you may just keep 20 or 30 of those. So there's just less data to work with. And the stuff you're throwing okay. out, again, empirically, doesn't seem to matter that much. Yeah, OK. That makes sense. Um, so then the, the next thing I have to think about is what I'm going to do with this, these MFCC coefficients. Because um, I can't throw every one of these little pixels here into my model. It would just totally overfit on that data. Um, so what I've done in my model, I think, yeah, it comes up next. So I'm taking a few statistics along the time axis for each of these coefficients. So I'm calculating my, my MFCC coefficients over the entire, entire time domain signal. But then along the time axis for each of them, um, once again, I'm going back to taking the, the mean, the standard deviation, um, the minimum, the maximum, the skewness, and the kurtosis. Uh, th those were somewhat empirically chosen, uh, so it's definitely something you could look at if either there's redundant information here or, or if there's something else that, that should be missing. But it was a nice, simple way to deal with all the information I had in these, um, these big MFCCs. Um, and the other thing I did is went through a handful of different features that the Brosa had in their library. Um, so special centroid bandwidth contrast, a few others. Um, so once again, I'm taking those same six statistics, the mean standard deviation, minimum max, skew and kurtosis um, for each of these features. So with 20 mel frequency coefficients, um, this results in about 170 variables, I believe, in total, um, which is kind of as, as many as you would want with only 10,000 data points. Um, any more features and you start to run into more, more risk of overfitting. Um, but this, this seems to work. Um, but definitely, if, if you want to try something, uh, one of the first things I would do is change the number of MFCCs, see if it actually does better with more or less of them. Um, so now I'm applying that to the data frame, the same as I've done before. Uh, this step takes probably an hour on, on my laptop. Um, so it's a lot of computations to churn through. So definitely, Make sure your fans aren't blocked by some clothing or something. Go grab a coffee. Um, so then this is going to take a couple minutes. Um, so now I'm using the same light GBM. Oh, go ahead. We'll let it run. Uh, so can you explain what, what you were doing there before? Um, you were trying to, yeah. Is so adding, is it me? I don't yeah. think it might be on. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so can you explain uh, what that, what you're doing again there? Um, um, this function you, here? Or? Yeah, are you trying to add these features into the overall uh, data frame for that, for each sample or something? Yeah. Um, what I've done this whole time is I, I keep just adding more columns to my data frame. Oh, okay. So I haven't gotten rid of anything previously. So right here I run um, train data frame feature names. This, this list of, this feature names is just a list of new column titles. 
it equals this progress apply of the spectral features. Um, so the these feature names have to coincide with um, everything that I'm returning in this function. You got a question, Matt? Yeah. Hello. Oh. There we go. Okay. Uh, how do you account for different lengths of the the spectrogram or substylogram or whatever it's called? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm just taking the mean and a few other statistics in this oh, time the axis. Whole, okay, sorry, yeah. I thought you were just taking in chunks. No. Um, and I guess the other question I have is, have you seen anyone use like robust statistics? So like a median, um, was it median absolute difference or something like that? Nope, I, I haven't. Um, I, I didn't look too hard though. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I was saying where these six aren't necessarily what you want. Um, those are other other features to play around with. Um, I love robust statistics, and I use it whenever I can. Uh, in this case, though, uh, you tend not to get outliers and things that where mm -hmm. that really helps the audio. And by the time you've gone to a spectrogram, you kind of smoothed over a lot of things, and, and so I'm not surprised that people haven't really gone that route. Yeah. The other thing, I, I am kind of assuming that the, the signal is fairly constant the whole way through, where essentially the, the audio file can be characterized by short segments of it um, and not just by one single point in it. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily fair. Um, yeah, okay, so... This is going to take a minute still. Um, so I'm 400 epics in. Um, actually, one thing I can go back to, um, if I can scroll through these fast enough. Yeah, so previously when I was trading, um, my log loss was over 2. Got down to about 2.2 .2 at the best. Um, and then we see with these new features right away, um, after a few hundred iterations, I'm right down pretty close to 1. Um, so getting that as low as possible is ideal. Um, so I'll just let that keep going. Um, it's going to plot the importances as well. So, um, Matt, so Matt, yeah, it's, it's Bob here. Yeah. Um, any length of uh, sample, right? Like it's not, I mean, you showed that graph with a 3.5 second uh, yeah. sample, but... Yes, yeah, so, so you've got 3.5 there, but generally it doesn't matter what the length is, right? No, it doesn't. Um, okay. That's why I've taken, that, that's part of why I've taken the um, statistics along that time dimension. It just kind of washes it out. Um, okay. So I've got the importances, so... Well, that runs. Um, so the last thing that I've done for this notebook that I don't think I'll have time to get through, um, but is to, I'm, I'm taking whichever iteration I get my best training point on here, and I just throw the whole data set at it. Um, so back here, I set my test size to zero. Um, so that, that means no validation set. And I rerun the same model for the same number of iterations with all of the data. Um, so with the, with the validation set, um, I end up getting a local validation. Make this bigger here. I got a local validation of 0.7854. And somehow my leaderboard score managed to be up at 0.835. Um, so I'm not entirely sure why I did that much better on the leaderboard, but I'm certainly not going to complain about that. Um, and then when I run it on the full data set, I get 0.836. So I, I only got an extra 0.001. Um, so that was surprising, but it might, maybe the, maybe the 835 is a statistical anomaly on the good end and Maybe that's kind of up underrepresenting itself. 
Um, but yeah, nothing to be concerned about. Those are, those are actually pretty good results for single model in this competition. Um, so I, I don't think I'm leaving out anything too major. And it's, it's a great, great point to start off with. Um, Mike's got you beat. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was just wondering, so going back to the point you said earlier about you know, splitting the data along the, the silences, have people tried to extend the data set by just sort of splitting up the samples a little bit? Because if, if, they're, if they're fairly sort of time homogenous, mm -hmm. then you should, you should be able to get a few clean samples out of them, right? And then Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen anyone do that yet, but I've got that on, I think, my very last slide here. Um, so I, I actually started writing a function to do that. Um, and actually, I tried doing that before I just took all these spectral um, features along the full time sample. So I kind of broke my rule of starting with the simple thing and getting more complicated. So I gave up on that pretty quickly. And Okay, so we actually just finished their training on this data set. Um, and I'll give us our validation in a second here. Um, yeah, so here are the feature importances that we get. So interestingly, kurtosis is still the single most important feature that I'm training on. Um, so the biggest piece of information I gather from that is that it's telling me something that nothing else in my model is. And I should try to hone in on it. Um, so one that I had, like probably the next two features I would make is the percentage of variables that are equal, or percentage of data points that are equal to the max. Um, so it's, if my theory that the kurtosis is actually um, capturing the signal clipping, if, if that theory is correct, that'll actually give us even more information near that feature. Um, but everything else seems pretty reasonable. Um, these MFCCs are certainly scattered up there, so they're quite relevant features. Um, yeah, and then same function to just create a submission. Um, it takes a minute to run through all the predictions. Um, yeah, so that's what I've got. It ends up with... 0.836 in the leaderboard. Um, so I'll just take a look at the leaderboard. Oh, killed for taking too long. Um, okay, so here's our leaderboard. So I'm down here in 35th right now. Um, so the, the best score is 0.93, which is pretty significantly better. Um, so it, it'd be interesting to see how far I can get off of this. Um, now, there's this other kernel here um, that clearly a fair number of people are submitting the results from because there's a lot of 0.895s there. Um, but this is actually a great kernel to look through. Um, he, takes, he takes a very different approach to the problem than I did. Um, still uses MFCCs, but he's actually using a, a convolutional neural network on them. Um, so he's got a list of his single model outputs at the bottom here. Um, let's see if we can zoom in. So his best, best single model is 0 0.844, also 809 and a 785. Um, so that 804 is on the um, 2D convolutional neural network on the MFCCs. And combining the three of those gave that 0.895. Um, so the interesting thing about that is um, I've got these next steps for a few different levels that I, I suggest it's something to look at. So first, try to get this notebook running. Notebook running. If, um, if you're new to this and, and want to actually get some submissions going. But I think the first thing that I would do, um, probably the best bang for the buck is combine the results from this notebook with the results from his. Um, I mean, if we look at the leaderboard, um, wherever that is here, I mean, you don't need to get much higher than 0.895 to be 
I mean, you only barely need to beat it to be in fifth place here. Um, so if you're looking at entering a competition, but you're really unsure about your skills and want to try out something, something simple, run my notebook, run his notebook, and combine the results. That'll put you right at the top of the leaderboard, and I'm pretty sure everyone in this room is capable of that. Um, you are totally allowed to do that. It is encouraged. Um, every, all the data released in these kernels is, is Apache 2.0. It's, it's all public domain. So go ahead. Um, this competition isn't for money, um, so it's not real high stakes. But even the ones that are for money, I'm absolutely amazed how often you can get in the top few percent with just submitting other people's kernels. Um, so maybe try a few little hyperparameter adjustments to beat them by a little bit. Um, so yeah, that, that's the first thing if, if you want to try out. Um, but the second thing is I haven't done, done much tuning of, of this model that I've trained. Um, my light GBM are basically defaults. I never played with them other than the number of iterations to train it for. So try to find the hyperparameters that could give you different results and try them out, see how they actually affect the results. Um, some of them, for example, like if you want to change the parameters of, of the light GBM model, you don't need to recalculate the features. So you can, you can change a value, run it, it takes five minutes, you've got a new score. And you can see how the local validation is doing. Um, stuff like changing the number of MEL septum coefficients, that takes a little longer, an, an hour or two, but it's still not too bad. Um, so if you're brand new to this, um, those, those three things, that's a great place to start. And you'll, you'll be right, right near the top of the leaderboard um, with just a few simple things like that. Uh, then... For the intermediate, um, try some new algorithms. Um, try neural network, try linear regression, maybe XGBoost or CatBoost perform better. Uh, there's a, a support vector machine. Um, there's lots of options there. Um, one thing I didn't, didn't do that apparently is, can be significant is actually normalizing this um, MFC coefficients. Um, so I don't know exactly how they'd be normalized, um, but definitely do some background reading, see what other people have done for that. Um, it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, then add or remove features. Um, anything that seems to make sense, just try it out. Um, now adding more data. The, the competition doesn't specifically exclude um, you're not. You're allowed to use external data sets if you tell everyone what you're using. Um, nobody seems to have done that yet, and I don't know how crazy you could get with that. Um, but if if you want to play around, look into that. Someone on the forums actually posted a link to to another data set um, that you could use to add more data. Um, another thing that's not too difficult to implement is actually take the take all of your test results that you have high confidence on and put them back into your training data and train on all of it. Um, it's a bit of a scary thing to do, but it, it quite often actually produces some pretty good results. That's not going to give you a drastic increase, but there's usually a little bit to gain from that. Um, and then, if you want to go a little more complicated, um, something like Mike said, where take a sliding window. If you, if you can assume that data is homogeneous, then you should be able to break it up into short segments, say a half a second. Um, so one thing that I, I did earlier on was I actually took a half a second window that I slided with a 50% um, overlap, and it created 200,000 data, data points instead of 9,000. 
Um, so the, if I were to continue on with this style of um, these st this style of predictions, that's one of the first things I would try um, that, that I think would actually make a pretty significant difference. Um, and then you can either assume that it is homogeneous and average the outputs over the whole time signal, or you could actually take the highest prediction. Bearing in mind you've actually got three different labels you can predict. Um, so you could do the first and third as the average and the second as the highest output. Um, and then build a neural network. So, so there's the great starter, um, this starter kernel. He walks through everything. I can't remember if it's PyTorch or Kiris, but either way, um, either way, it's a great notebook to to do a CNN with. But one thing I'd actually like to try is taking some other features that I'm training my models on and append them to the outputs of the neural network. Um, so either concatenate them to the dense layer of the neural network or actually take the dense layer of the neural network and throw it into a tree-based, like light GBM. Um, and the final thing is just ignore me and do whatever you want. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. Okay, are there any more questions? Uh, you may have said this and I was just tuned out, but in terms of yeah. uh, neural networks, are people looking at RNNs, uh, anybody? Not that I've seen. Um, either uh, the one was a 1D convolutional neural network on the time domain signal, and the other was the MFCC and a 2D CNN on that. So the, the super advanced thing, I think, would be to try an RNN and, <laughs> uh, or, and or attention, I think, would be interesting to try on a problem like this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, were there some sounds? Oh, here, here comes the mic. Wait for the microphone. Yeah. Were there some sounds uh, which were easier, or in sense you had more accuracy compared to some other sounds where we had less, less accuracy? So, uh, was there a difference in that? Yeah. Um, there are definitely, as far as I'm concerned, there are some that are easier and harder but I haven't actually looked at the model's accuracy on them. I would expect something like uh, a musical instrument would be uh, more accurate than a baby's laugh or something. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, uh, intuition. <laughs> because, it, uh, because they have more steady frequency, same, same frequencies, and, and baby's laughter is just a mixture of lots of frequencies. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's worth looking into. Um, I haven't done it, but I'm I'm sure there's categories that it performs better and worse on. Uh, I was going to say I think your percentage trimming statistics there between the train and test are like very interesting. I mean, okay, like these are pretty big. Like it's like nine thousand ish of each, right? And yeah, and like what was that? Thirty seven and twenty nine percent. I mean. Like, what's going on there? What is different about this test? Because, I mean, we know, like, Kaggle is driven so much by flaws in the competitions, and sometimes yeah. they're leaks and sometimes they're not. But, I mean, especially, I mean, if there's, like, a relationship between, like, the trimming and the training data and the class, like, I mean, does that tell us that the class distribution is different in the test set or something like that? I don't, I don't know how to get to the bottom of it, but that's an interesting lead. Yeah. Actually, one thought I had um, come to you in a minute is, Maybe the test set is actually easier. Maybe they're all manually verified, and that, that would explain why I'm getting better performance on the test. And maybe people are discarding, discarding weird audio signals that have, have more sounds at the beginning and end. So that sort of thing is very possible. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, did you listen to the trimmed middle audio to see that they were still... Like very like identifiable, and similarly with the like thirty or half second sliding window, like it, is that long enough for you to verify them? I didn't listen to either, um, so I couldn't tell you. 
Yeah. Um, um, do you have a mic with you? Yeah. With you first. Couldn't you game like the this score by giving all of one category? Like so like one, two, three, and that would give you an idea of like just how many um, like what the class distribution is in the test? Yep, you could. It's kind of against the rules. I don't know how explicitly it's stated. Uh, we're limited to two submissions per day. So you'd spend three weeks doing all 41. But, but it's, if you really wanted to, you could. Yeah. What are some strategies to validate more data? What do you mean by validate? Like the manually get more, I guess, uh, more label data. Yeah. Um, so one simple thing is adding noise to the data. Um, but more, more realistically, what you want to do, and I'll show you what a different user on the forums found. Um, if we are here. <coughs> so this user here actually found a data set that BBC released. A total of, I think it was 16,000 audio files. Um, and some of them are actually pretty long. So they don't all overlap, but this is the sort of thing you'd want to get your extra data from, um, especially if it's a nice, clean, labeled data source. Um, if, if I wanted to get lots of data, I'd try to find something like this. Okay. Okay, so more questions can uh, be taken at Food and Drinks. Uh, and actually, how, how long would it take you to get that prediction thing where we can listen to the sound and see the model prediction with your good model? Did that take a um, long time to go? That would be a great way to like to end the whole thing. So I'll just do, I'll talk and if you can get okay. that. So. Okay, awesome. <laughs> I love that thing. <laughs> okay, so uh, so now we're going to talk about kind of the meetups to come in two weeks and a month from now. Uh, Matt Emery, you suggested that maybe you'd be interested in two weeks or a month from now, and Stan is also interested. So I guess, yeah, we, I, we should probably figure it out now so that everybody here can know if uh, which one it's going to be, so you can kind of talk a bit about it. Stan, do you think you would be ready in two weeks, or would you rather go in a month from now? Oh, well, you got the first and fourth place already posted, and you guys did amazing. I think that's plenty of good material. Okay. So let's do that. Do you want to just maybe say, sorry, do you want to just say, like, maybe a 30-second thing on what the competition is about? Well, it was the data science bowl, and the idea was to recognize uh, cell nuclei in medical images. Uh, so basically, there was a whole bunch of images taken using different types of microscopy and such, and uh, it was basically an image segmentation problem because there were a lot of nuclei in each image, and you needed to figure out where they are exactly using the intersection over union metric. So it's not just, uh, you, you did, it was not enough to just count the nuclei and approximately say where they are, but you actually were in, they were actually interested in the shape of those nuclei as well. You had to predict the more or less the exact shape of them. Okay, awesome. So that will be in two weeks from now. Uh, and now we're going to go for drinks, but first, uh, just to kind of see us out, I want to see if we can do one or two sound and predictions. <laughs>